All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to welcome you to today's um, Behavioral and Social Sciences Research Lecture. Um, today we're going to have Colleen McClung speaking. Um, Dr. McClung is a molecular biologist um, who has studied complex psychiatric diseases and drug addiction. Um, she started her career as a, uh, or was from 2005 to 2011, was an assistant professor in the psychiatry department for, uh, and Center for Basic Neuroscience at UT Southwestern. And she um, most recently moved to uh, the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine as associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, she has published several high-profile papers and has received funding from several NIH ICs, including NIDA, NIMH, and NINDS. Um, she's received several awards, um, including the President's Research Council Distinguished Young Investigator Award, um, and received an honorable mention from the Free, of, for the Friedman Award uh, for basic research at NARSAD. And so overall, the goal of her research is to understand the mechanisms by which circadian genes regulate mood and reward and to develop novel therapies for psychiatric diseases. I'm going to turn it over her, to her now to, to talk about um, her talk today. So please join me in welcoming her. All right, thank you. It's, uh, it's nice to be here at the NIH. Um, and uh, as Tisha mentioned, we are, uh, we recently moved um, this summer, actually, from um, UT Southwestern Medical Center to uh, University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And um, so we're, uh, we're starting uh, new research there, which is very exciting. But today I'm going to tell you about um, some of our work on uh, the clock gene and uh, how it's involved in the regulation of mood and reward and uh, manic-like behaviors. So uh, the clock gene is, um, uh, is a, a central regulator of circadian rhythms. And circadian rhythms are essentially a, um, a process that um, goes over 24 hours. It's our 24-hour internal biological clock, which controls a bunch of different things, including sleep-wake, uh, body temperature, blood pressure, um, even bowel movements, alertness, coordination. All of these things um, are regulated over a 24-hour cycle. And the master pacemaker, which controls circadian rhythms, is located in a part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, um, which is controlled directly by light uh, through the retina. And uh, this leads to synchronization of rhythms throughout the brain and the rest of the body. And while this is the, ma the master pacemaker in the brain, uh, essentially, every cell in the brain and every cell in the body contains its own circadian clock, which can be synchronized by the SCN or can be desynchronized in um, the presence of other stimuli like food or drugs of abuse uh, or other things that might reset or desynchronize the circadian clock. And the molecular clock is um, composed of a transcriptional translational feedback loop, um, which is generally regulated by the clock protein, uh, which binds to BMAL1 and binds to the EBOX sequence in a number of different genes, including the period genes and the cryptochrome genes. And then these proteins uh, will bind together. They're modified by uh, several different post-translational modifications. They go back into the nucleus and inhibit the activity of clock and BMAL1. So this sets up this very nice transcriptional translational feedback loop, which cycles over the course of 24 hours. And there are other genes that are now uh, known to be involved in this, including ROAR alpha, Reberv alpha, NPAS2, which also um, aid in the timing of this, um, this clock. But today I'm going to focus really mostly on this central regulator here, clock. And uh, these rhythms control lots of different things, as I mentioned before. And we know that disruptions in circadian rhythms are, um, are very, um, can cause very severe health problems. Um, including uh, jet lag, sleep problems, and they even increase the risk for cancer, heart disease, and obesity. So disruptions of this uh, naturally occurring circadian cycle um, can really have profound impact on human health. And we know from a lot of work in the clinic that people um, with mood disorders, like major depression and bipolar disorder and seasonal affective disorder, 
uh, have very severely disrupted circadian rhythms. So depression and bipolar disorder are associated with major disruptions in sleep and activity, and this is, this is very profound and is actually one of the major diagnostic tools for use in, um, in these diseases. We know that changes in schedule can precipitate especially manic episodes in bipolar patients. So somebody may be going along fine, and then they work a different shift or they travel or something, and this will set them off into a manic episode. Depression is also diurnal, so the worst symptoms usually occur in the morning. It's often seasonal, and seasonal affective disorder is actually the most common mood disorder. And depression occurs more frequently in areas of the world where there's little daylight for long periods of time, like Alaska. We also know that people with a preference towards eveningness, so night owls versus morning larks, are more susceptible to depression. And in fact, the vast majority of bipolar patients are evening types versus morning types. And now there's been a number of circadian um, genes that have been uh, found in genetic studies, um, which have uh, SNPs or uh, different polymorphisms that associate with, um, primarily with bipolar disorder, but also with seasonal affective disorder and depression. And the clock protein in particular, um, there are several SNPs in the clock gene that are associated with um, a prevalence for bipolar disorder and severity of symptoms in, in bipolar disorder. We also know that most of the treatments for depression um, are, affect the circadian clock, and these include things like bright light therapy, which is shown here, where um, the patient will sit in front of a light for 30 minutes uh, in the morning, and this will shift the circadian clock and help to treat seasonal affective disorder. Uh, total sleep deprivation is actually a very effective short-term antidepressant. Um, unfortunately, it only works until the people go to sleep again, uh, but it, it works pretty well in the, in the ER. Social rhythm therapy was actually pioneered um, by David Kupfer and Ellen Frank at the University of Pittsburgh, where um, they put bipolar patients on very strict circadian schedules, so very, very strict sleep-wake and social and, and eating schedules. And this helps to uh, prevent the um, appearance of new uh, mood-related episodes. Melatonin therapy has been used to some extent, although melatonin is not such a great um, antidepressant. Uh, it's really not an antidepressant at all. It does help um, in uh, some of the sleep symptoms. Uh, but there is a new, um, a new drug, agamelatin, which has been approved for depression in, um, in Europe and th in the rest of the world, basically, uh, which is a melatonin receptor agonist, which um, is very effective for treating uh, depression. As well, drugs like lithium and uh, SSRIs, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, will uh, profoundly affect circadian rhythms. So lithium will lengthen the circadian period. SSRIs will sh advance the circadian period. Um, so basically, all of these different treatments will affect uh, circadian rhythms. We also know that uh, people with um, drug addiction, uh, problems with addictive disorders, also have very disrupted circadian rhythms. And our lab really studies both uh, mood disorders and drug addiction. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to be talking mostly today about um, the mood disorders, although I'll throw in a little bit about addiction. But these are sort of the three different ways our lab is really studying um, the, the impact of circadian rhythm disruptions and circadian gene disruptions on, addic on addiction. First, it's that people with circadian rhythm disruptions seem to be more vulnerable to addiction. Um, they're also going to be more vulnerable to mood disorders, and they're often very comorbid. Second is that drugs of abuse can entrain circadian rhythms uh, such that the drug is anticipated um, by the brain, leading to increased craving and drug seeking. So, for example, if you have cocktails every day at 5 o'clock, uh, your brain reward system will start to anticipate those cocktails at 5 o'clock. And about 4, 4.30, you might start thinking about them, wanting them, craving them. It's because the reward system is, is being set by that, uh, that drug. Also, long-term exposure to drugs of use can lead to disruptions in the cir circadian system. <coughs> Excuse me which lead to long-lasting mood and sleep problems, which might contribute to relapse. And this is seen a lot with, uh, with alcoholics. So how does the circadian system influence mood and reward? So to study this, we um, were looking at mouse models. And most of you probably know this, but um, 
basically these are some of the, the tests that we use to determine if a mouse is <coughs> excuse me, anxious or depressed or likes drugs or any of these things. And so we, we use um, tests like the force swim test, learn helplessness test, to, look, to uh, look at behavioral despair, models of depression. We use tests like the open field and elevated plus maze to look at anxiety and things like condition place preference and self-administration to look at drug reward. So all these really help us to determine what's going on with our mouse, basically. <coughs> so what about mice with the mutation in the clock gene? Uh, we wanted to know what kind of behavioral phenotypes they would have. And fortunately, Joe Takahashi had created a mouse with a mutation in the clock gene, which um, creates a dominant negative protein. These are the clock delta-19 mice. So we wanted to put them through a battery of tests and see what sort of uh, behavioral phenotypes they had. And um, very interestingly, we found that these mice, basically in every way that we could test them, they really resembled bipolar patients, but specifically in the manic state. So uh, this is just a comparison here. So they were very hyperactive. They sleep less than wild-type mice. They're less depressed in those behavioral models that I mentioned. They have lower levels of anxiety, so sort of increased risk-taking behavior, more exploratory behavior. And they're also more sensitive to the rewarding effects of pretty much everything, cocaine, sucrose, brain stimulation. Uh, they find these things really, really rewarding. And when we gave them uh, lithium uh, chronically, this was able to reverse uh, the majority of their phenotypes, making them a very nice model of, uh, of human mania. We've gone on to do a few more addiction studies with these mice. Uh, we did a self-administration study and found that uh, this single point mutation in the clock gene actually makes mice more vulnerable to, to cocaine addiction when looking at self-administration. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of this, but essentially these mice will now take cocaine, especially during the day when wild-type mice on the same background will not take cocaine at all at this time point. Uh, they have an increase in infusions per session, and it's not just that they're running around pressing lever levers wildly. They, um, they don't press the inactive lever. They have a selection for the active lever. And uh, they find, uh, basically, they self-administer at uh, a greater extent to almost every dose, and they'll work harder to obtain a cocaine, so they'll press mo the lever more times to get, to, uh, get a single infusion of cocaine. So, all this taken together basically suggests that a mutation in the clock gene leads to a, a real vulnerability for um, addiction. We've also looked at alcohol, so we wanted to know if this was specific to stimulants, and basically they show an increase in ethanol preference as well. Uh, so this is preference and consumption um, over wild-type mice. So not just stimulants, but depressants as well. So these behavioral phenotypes basically led us to um, wonder what could be going on in their brain, and we, we decided to focus on the dopamine system, which is basically the circuit between the ventral tegmental area and uh, the nucleus accumbens, this dopaminergic reward circuit, uh, to see what, uh, what might be going on in, in this circuit in the brains of the clock uh, delta-19 mice. And so uh, when we recorded from the dopamine neurons, this is, uh, these are slice recordings, what we found is that uh, the clock mutants have an increase in dopamine self-firing, as shown here. And when we gave them lithium, this actually returned their firing rate to that of wild-type mice. And as you can see here, um, wild-type mice, um, lithium has no effect on their self-firing. So the lithium is specifically altering the dopaminergic uh, firing rate in, uh, in the clock mutant mice. So these mice seem to be hyperdopaminergic, and we've done this also in vivo, and they have increased cell firing and bursting um, as well in vivo. So we wanted to know if we could rescue uh, their behavioral phenotypes by putting a clock, a functional clock protein specifically into the VTA of the clock mutant mice. And to do this, we used an AAV virus where we put in a functional clock protein, injected that right into the VTA, and this was able to uh, reverse their locomotor phenotype. So here we have a mutant with uh, just a virus with GFP and the mutant with the functional clock. And you can see compared to the GFP here that you put a functional clock back in the VTA and 
you get normal locomotor behavior. As well, we saw a normalization of behavioral behavior in the open field. So uh, clock is really functioning in the VTA to uh, control some of these behaviors. We did the opposite experiment where we wanted to knock down clock specifically in the VTA of otherwise wild type mice. Again, we took an AAV vector and we created a short hairpin RNA which matched the, uh, the sequence of the clock gene and put that into the VTA of otherwise wild type mice. And when we recorded from these neurons, we saw also that um, knocking down clock in the VTA was sufficient to increase dopaminergic cell firing, as shown here, both compared to um, GFP negative cells that were right next to it and um, with an AAV scrambled control. So this was similar to what we saw in the clock mutant mice. And, uh, Knocking down clock in the VTA recapitulated uh, some of the behavioral effects that we see in the clock delta-19. So the hyperactivity and changes in the elevated plus maze, dark light, open field, uh, they became less anxious in all of these different measures. So looks like the clock delta-19 mice. However, to our surprise, we actually saw an increase in depression-related behavior. So this is shown in the latency to immobility in the forced swim test and latency to escape or failures to escape in the learned helplessness test. And essentially what this is showing is that uh, a knockdown of clock in the VTA leads to greater levels of depression. So this was opposite to what we saw in the clock delta-19 mice, um, which was really interesting because, of course, bipolar patients uh, have bouts of both mania and depression. So here, different manipulations of clock were leading to either decreased depression or increased depression. And uh, as you remember, these mice also had an increase in dopaminergic activity. And we also found this interesting um, because Eric Nessler's group had uh, recently shown that mice that have a depression-like phenotype following chronic social defeat stress, where mice are basically beaten up day after day after day, uh, mice that become susceptible to this, so they show a depression-like phenotype at the end of this paradigm, also have an increase in dopamine cell firing versus mice that were unsusceptible or resilient to this um, paradigm. So what this tells us is that increased dopamine cell firing is associated with, with a manic-like phenotype, a depression-like phenotype, and some kind of mixed phenotype where we have less anxiety but increased depression. Uh, so we're, we're currently um, trying to understand the importance of this, um, this change in firing in all, across all of these different mood states. Interestingly also, this, when we knocked uh, down clock in the VTA, we also saw an increase in alcohol preference and alcohol consumption, similar to the um, clock mutant mice. So again, knocking down clock in the VTA increased alcohol uh, intake. So how important was dopamine in the development of the manic-like behavior and the reversal by lithium? So this was showing that these things are associated, but we wanted to look more closely at the role of dopamine in these behaviors. So again, we used a virus to change the firing rate of the dopamine neurons in the clock mutant mice. So uh, this is a potassium channel virus, um, KIR 2.1. It expresses a potassium channel, which has been used by uh, several different labs in the past to manipulate uh, cell firing. And we injected in the VTA and showed that the infected cells indeed have lower firing rates. So this is sort of mimicking the effects of lithium, as you recall, on the, um, on the activity of the dopamine neurons. And we found that this was sufficient to decrease their hyperactivity um, and change their levels of anxiety. So. Um, this led to a normalization of anxiety, so they're becoming more anxious, more like wild-type mice in, in the dark light and the elevated plus maze. However, when we measured uh, depression-related behaviors, we actually saw no change in depression-related behaviors. So changing the firing rate of dopamine neurons was sufficient to change the anxiety-related phenotypes, but not the depression-related phenotypes. So we, we also wanted to know if um, dopamine cell firing was changed over the course of, of the 24-hour period in the clock mutant mice, if there was a time of day maybe where the difference was most pronounced. And so to do this, we collaborated with um, 
Kafuita Zaraza and Miguel Nicolelis at Duke University and did in vivo recordings um, while animals were in REM sleep bouts. So here, uh, the clock mutant mice, sorry, wild type mice have this nice rhythm in REM sleep where they're having uh, the most sleep during the day, less sleep during the night. Uh, however, the clock mutants, as you might expect, uh, lose their rhythm in REM sleep, but they still have some bouts of REM sleep. And when we measured dopamine cell firing during uh, their sleep bouts, we saw that there was much more of an increase during the day than during the night, although it's generally increased over that of wild type. So the clock mutants are having their most pronounced effects of dopamine during the day when they should be sleeping. And so we wondered if, um, if we were to um, alter uh, daytime VTA uh, firing in a wild type mouse, could we make this mouse manic? So to do this, we collaborated with uh, Carl Dyseroth at Stanford University. And we're using a technique called optogenetics where um, we put a, um, a channel rhodopsin, uh, which is a light activated channel, directly into the VTA of mice. And in this particular study, we use TH Cree mice, so, so mice which have the Cree recombinase driven by the tyrosine hydroxylase promoter, which allows us to express this virus only in dopamine neurons in the, um, in the VTA. And we wanted to do a, a chronic stimulation. Uh, most optogenetic studies have used acute stimulations, but we really wanted to do a chronic stimulation to kind of mimic what was going on in the clock mutant mice. So we used a novel opsin that they had just developed in the Dyseroth lab called a step function opsin, which um, has a very slow activating um, activity and basically just makes the cell more permissible to activation over long periods of time. And so what we did was we, uh, we did surgeries. So we injected the AAV virus with the step function opsin in the VTA um, of the TH Cree mice waited for four weeks to allow expression. Then we did a seven-day chronic stimulation paradigm where we uh, gave them light pulses over an hour a day uh, during, just during the daytime for seven days. Then we did the elevated plus maze, open field, tail suspension, and we gave booster stimulation te uh, in between so that we'd keep that level of dopamine up. And the control group had all the same procedures, but no light during that, uh, that seven-day uh, stimulation. Uh, so we wanted to know um, how these mice would behave in, um, in behavioral tests. Importantly, uh, this chronic stimulation pattern had no effect on general locomotor activity, so their locomotor activity was, uh, was unaffected, it was normal. However, when we looked at the elevated plus maze, they showed an increase in open arm time, which is... Um, indicative of less anxiety, and increased time in the center of the open field, and uh, a decrease in the latency uh, to enter the open field. So essentially, uh, chronic stimulation of VTA dopamine um, in otherwise wild type mice during the day leads to less anxiety, excuse me, increased exploratory behavior, uh, but no change in, in general locomotion. And when we looked at the tail suspension test, which is thought to be a measure of depression-related behavior, although that's sort of debated, um, we saw no change. So again, similar to the effects we got with the uh, potassium channel stimulation, uh, or the potassium channel reduction in VTA cell firing, where we saw no change in depression-related behavior, stimulating dopamine cell firing also led to no change in depression-related behavior. So, Basically, there's something going on with the dopamine neurons in terms of depression, but there's, there's likely other circuits and other regions that are, are contributing to, um, to this effect. So we wanted to get beyond um, just dopamine uh, itself and look more at the overall circuit. So again, we, um, we collaborated with uh, Kafui, Dizaraza, and Miguel Nicolelis, and we looked at... Um, this phenomenon called cross-frequency phase coupling, which is where the amplitude of high-frequency neural oscillatory activity is modulated by the phase of low-frequency um, oscillation. So essentially, this is shown here where the high, the gamma um, oscillations, uh, which are in red, will match up with the green uh, low-frequency oscillations in a synchronous way. 
And this is thought to be really involved in um, higher cognition and higher um, thinking, basically when you have these types of synchronizations. Um, and you can see where it's off here, where there's, there's no coupling of the two. And we looked within the nucleus accumbens, the prelimbic cortex, and the VTA in freely moving animals. So these mice are implanted with tetrodes, um, but they're in these various regions, but they're, they're moving around freely. And what we found was that um, in wild type mice, there is um, a negative correlation between the amount of coupling that is seen in the nucleus accumbens and the amount that the animal will travel in the open field. So essentially, the less coupling they have, the more likely they're going to run around in the center of an open field, so the, kind of the less anxiety they might have. Uh, in the clock mutants here, you can see there's just no correlation at all. It's, it's a flat line. They have uh, very little uh, coupling between these oscillations in the nucleus accumbens. And remarkably, when we give them lithium, this is able to rescue the coupling now within the nucleus accumbens. So somehow lithium is able to overcome this um, lack of synchronization and bring, bring things back to where they should be. So we also looked at synchronization not only within, uh, within a brain region, but also between brain regions, so within a whole circuit. And we wanted to look in um, while the animals were doing an anxiety-related paradigm. So this is while the animals, the animals were doing um, an elevated zero maze, which is similar to an elevated plus maze, but um, basically just in a, a zero shape. So it still has closed arms. It still has open arms, uh, but it's, it's in a zero shape. And what Kafui, who did these experiments, what he realized is that the um, synchronization between different brain regions, particularly in the high frequency, the gamma oscillatory region, uh, which again is thought to be very important for higher thinking, higher reasoning, um, that this became predictive of what the animal was going to do on this maze. So here at time zero is when an animal is inside the closed arms, but they're about to maybe make the decision to go into an open arm, which is an anxiety provoking environment. And what you can see is when you look between the nucleus accumbens and amygdala, nucleus accumbens and VTA, or nucleus accumbens and prefrontal cortex, um, you start to see these synchronization uh, events. So anything above the red line is where you're getting synchronization between these regions in firing rates. And, uh, and so you start to see this just before the animals are making the decision to go out there. And so presumably this is involved in the fear response or them trying to make that decision that they're going to go out. And the clock mutants almost completely lack this synchronization between these regions. Uh, and of course they just run out into the open arm much more, much more frequently. So we think that this um, synchronization across regions is particularly important in higher decision making. Yeah? Sorry? I didn't understand what you said at first. Is that an order parameter is that, is that Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, basically, bas it's, uh, he's creating a z-score where you're, um, he's looking at the synchronization between the gamma oscillatory bands in the, uh, as he's recording. So the clock, the clock gene seems to be involved in not only um, circadian rhythm regulation, but also synchronization between regions um, just while animals are, are uh, doing normal tasks. So uh, clock is a transcription factor, so we want to know what are the uh, transcriptional targets which might be involved in all of this that, uh, that clock is regulating in the VTA nucleus accumbens circuit. So we did a microarray analysis of uh, the VTA of the clock mutant mice versus wild type mice. And um, we found a number of genes that were differentially regulated, um, including genes that are very important in the regulation of dopamine transmission, such as uh, tyrosine hydroxylase, um, colchicystokinin, uh, and some others. And of course, we found genes involved in circadian rhythms to be regulated, which uh, you would expect in a clock mutant mouse. So that was sort of a control, which was nice. Um, and we've, we've begun to look at, at some of these genes individually, and I'm only going to tell you about one today, which is colchicystokinin. 
So um, it's also called CCK, and CCK is a neuropeptide which is co-released with dopamine, which acts to feed back and inhibit the activity of dopamine neurons. So if you have less CCK, you're likely to have greater dopaminergic activity. So we did uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation assays um, using an antibody for the clock protein and found that uh, clock directly regulates the expression of, C of CCK, uh, which is shown here. So clock is directly binding the promoter of the CCK uh, gene. And it's um, doing it in EBOX dependent fashion. So uh, here is in um, cell culture when you have a CCK luciferase uh, reporter. You add in CLOCK and BMAL1, you get an increase. When you mutate the E-box, this takes it away. So CLOCK is binding to the E-box at the CCK promoter directly. Uh, one of the reasons we were really interested in CCK is because um, when we looked at lithium treatment, we saw that lithium treatment was able to bring levels of CCK back towards that of wild-type mice. So here, again, lithium had no effect on the CCK levels of the wild-type mice. Um, here's the clock mutant mice. It has a, a dramatic decrease in CCK, but we give lithium, it goes back up towards normal. I was actually wondering, did you do that in Yeah, so we we're actually in the process of doing all that now. Um, we had, yeah, I had a, um, a grant to, to look at that. Basically, we but we were we decided to do it in a big fashion where we're looking over different times of day, and at different brain regions. Yeah. And so we haven't completed it yet. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't looked at them yet, but we're, we're planning to do that. Um, so we also got some um, human uh, tissue from um, our brain bank at UT Southwestern, which is run by Carol Tominga. And um, we found when we looked at CCK in, um, in human postmortem tissue that uh, subjects, compared to control subjects, subjects that were off medication had a decrease similar to the clock mutant mice in CCK expression, and those that were on medication at the time of death uh, had a normalized um, CCK expression. So this was very nicely matched what we saw in the clock mutant mice, which also made us very excited about CCK. So um, we wondered how lithium was able to um, reverse the, um, the expression of CCK and bring it back up to normal in the clock mutant mice. And there's a couple of different ways that this could happen. Um, we first actually looked at um, to see if maybe there was an increase in CREB binding um, or CREB activity of this promoter. And it turns out CREB actually doesn't bind this promoter in vivo, um, as a, uh, contrary to the in vitro studies that we'd seen. But we decided then to look at chromatin modifications. And we thought maybe lithium might be affecting um, chromatin structure and thereby allowing more permissive transcription. So um, we looked at um, acetylated histone H3, which, of course, if histone H3 is acetylated, it will um, more, it'll make the chromatin more permissible to, uh, to transcription. It'll open it up from those, um, the histones. And so uh, what you can see is that um, when we looked at mutant animals given lithium, we saw an increase in acetylated H3 at the CCK promoter. Uh, compared to um, compared to the uh, wa the water controls, and we did see a little bit of an increase with wild type mice when we gave lithium, but it, it wasn't significant. And when we looked at histone H4, we actually saw a much more dramatic phenotype, where uh, there seems to be a selective increase in acetylation of histone H4 at the CCK promoter in the mutant mice given lithium. So this suggests that uh, lithium treatment is altering the chromatin structure and allowing more permissive transcription of um, the CCK gene. So then we wondered if we gave um, the mice valproic acid, which is another, um, another mood stabilizing drug which is known to inhibit the activity of histone deacetylases, so the proteins that normally take away 
histone acetylation, we wondered if this would act like lithium and be able to reverse their phenotypes. And as well, we wanted, because valproate does um, several different things, it's not just an HDAC inhibitor, it affects a lot of protein. So we went to a more specific HDAC inhibitor, SAHA, um, and we, we again wanted to know if it would change the behaviors of the, of the clock meat mice. And what we found was that both valproate and SAHA restored their um, anxiety-related phenotypes to that of wild-type mice. And both drugs had no effect on wild-type mice in the open field um, or the time spent in the light and the dark light. Saha did have a little bit of an anti-anxiety effect um, when you look at percent time in the light um, here. And, uh, and that's common. Sometimes with lithium or valproate, you will see an anti-anxiety effect. So Saha, in this particular case here, was causing a little bit of an anti-anxiety effect in wild-type mice, but clearly was having the opposite effect in clock mutant mice. And when we looked at depression-related behaviors, we saw that uh, this is in the four swim tests. Again, both Valproe and Saha were able to uh, begin to reverse their depression-related behaviors, making them more like wild-type mice. So this would suggest that HDAC inhibition could be a novel therapeutic target um, for the treatment of bipolar disorder. So just to wrap up, um, basically, uh, I hope you appreciate that um, circadian rhythm disruption is, um, is potentially involved in, um, in the development of psychiatric diseases, in particular, mutations in circadian genes, uh, like the clock gene, can really have dramatic impacts on mood and um, reward-related regions of the brain. And this is just sort of a, an attempt to make all of this into a diagram. Um, where basically you would have the light-dark cycle affecting the SCN, uh, which is going to um, regulate indirect projections and hormone regulation and circadian patterns of neuronal firing, as well as sleep-wake regulation, which can all feed into these uh, reward and mood-related circuits in the brain, which are all connected to each other and synchronizing to each other um, as animals are exploring different tasks or involved in different mood-related um, or anxiety-related paradigms. Uh, there's circadian gene expression going on in all of these different regions and circadian clocks going in all these different regions, so they may become desynchronized from each other by things like stress, drugs of abuse, other zeitgebers, et cetera. Um, and lithium and valproic acid, as well as other HDAC inhibitors, might be able to come in and, and regulate some of these circuits, creating better uh, synchrony, um, maybe uh, change some of the neuronal firing rates. And all of this um, needs to be in line to control all of these different uh, facets of mood, activity, reward, m motivation, et cetera. So it's very complicated. You know, there's a lot of factors feeding into this, but hopefully we can um, start to dissect um, what these different regions are, um, how, they're, how they're communicating with each other, how they're involved in these different facets of manic-like and depression-like behavior, um, and how these other um, environmental stimuli are, are involved in, in modulating this. So I'll stop there and thank um, the current members of my lab and some past members of my lab that worked on this. Um, very uh, great group of people to work with um, and they, um, they really uh, have, have produced some tremendous work. We have lots of collaborators, um, I think I mentioned them along the way. Um, uh, who really help, especially with the electrophysiology, since we're, uh, we're molecular biologists, behaviorists, we're not, we're not electrophysiologists. Um, some of our collaborators at UT Southwestern, and of course our funding, um, particularly from the NIH, which has been very generous to us um, to fund these studies. Uh, and this is just Dallas here in uh, our new home in Pittsburgh. So thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so the clock delta-19 is a dominant negative protein. Um, in our hands, when they're in a light-dark cycle, they do show some circadian rhythms, um, but they're very messy. 
Um, they don't entrain very well to the light. Um, if you were to put them into constant darkness, then they will go into um, arrhythmic behavior pretty quickly. But these, all these experiments were done in animals which were in a light-dark cycle. So they still show some rhythms, but they're, they're pretty messy. Um, we did try to give them lithium to see if that would affect um, or re-entrain maybe their circadian period in the dark phase, and it didn't seem to, at least in the 10 days that we gave it for most of our experiments. We might need to go longer in order to see it do that, um, but we haven't done that with the HDAC inhibitors yet, so I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so there's actually several possibilities that we, we've come up with for what's going on here. One of them is that there might be different patterns of bursting versus tonic firing. Um, so uh, the burst firing is very important for um, reward-related events, especially unexpected reward, these types of things. And we have a collaborator at Mount Sinai who also works with Eric Nessler who, um, who thinks this might be the case. He thinks that there might be some change in the tonic versus phasic firing that's important in the development of the depression versus a manic-like phenotype. Another possibility is that there are different populations of dopamine neurons which are being selectively activated. So there are neurons, so not all the dopamine neurons project to the nucleus accumbens. There's also dopamine neurons that project to the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. So it's possible that we're actually activating a select population of neurons. And that's actually an experiment we're um, about to, to do um, using optogenetics is to do projection-based targeting where we can put the um, channel rhodopsin into the VTA but put the light in the prefrontal cortex or the nucleus accumbens or amygdala or wherever and then see if we specifically stimulate one of those populations what kind of behavior are we going to get. Um, and then there's, uh, there's some other possibilities but I think those are mo the, most, the main two that we're sort of focusing on right now. Yeah, so we did look at uh, GSK3 beta, and it does seem to be pretty normal in the clock mutant mice. Um, we haven't looked to see if HDAC activity is normal, although we didn't see very many, we didn't see any global changes in chromatin. Um, when we just did sort of Western blots for acetylated H3 or H4. We didn't really see any global changes, so, um, but we haven't looked at any specific HDACs to see if there's changes in activity. Yeah, I wish we knew. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know how it's doing it, honestly. Um, we, uh, you know, we could come up with all different theories, and it may ultimately be through GSK3 beta at some level, but, um, but we don't know. We don't know how it's affecting. Um, we don't, and we don't know if it's through an increase in acetylation or a decrease in HDAC function. You know, we, don't, we don't know which, which way it's affecting it, so it could be either one. Yeah, so um, several of the genes do cycle, but um, clock actually affects a number of genes that don't cycle. Um, so it, it affects both, yeah, a number of those genes. So CCK is one that does have a, a very prominent circadian cycle. Um, but yeah, it definitely affects genes that don't cycle. Mm-hmm. Right, so, right, yeah, so we have looked at, um, at the period gene uh, mutants, and um, so uh, we've looked at PER1, PER2, and PER3, and the combination, the double knockouts of PER1 and PER2, and um, essentially, uh, they don't have the same phenotype, so they don't have this overall manic-like phenotype. Um, they do have, so the, the single gene uh, knockouts don't seem to have much of a difference in phenotype in terms of anxiety or depression related behavior or reward related behavior. But the double knockouts, the PER1 and PER2 double knockouts, have actually an increase in anxiety, so the opposite of what we see with the clock mutant mice. 
and but they have a decrease in depression related behavior so they're kind of weird and we don't really know what to make of that um, but they're, they're not hyperactive and they don't have all of the same features that the clock mutant mice have we have tested bmal1 knockout mice um, which are hard to work with because they're very sick um, but they from what we little we were able to do with them um, they did have hyperactivity and they did have some of the same features of the clock mutants. So we think that it is BMAL1 and clock together, but whether it's then through the period genes and cryptochrome genes and all of that affecting it, um, we don't think so. It's probably doing something else on these other genes, maybe CCK, TH, some of these other targets that are more relevant than, than the period and cryptochrome. Now, whether or not the circadian disruption is important for this, we felt like maybe doing these, this initial knockdown in the VTA was going to give us that answer, but because we figured we would knock down clock in the VTA, we'd probably have normal circadian rhythms, and we'd be able to kind of tease that apart. But it turns out when you knock down clock in the VTA, you, you get circadian rhythm disruptions in locomotor activity. So we still can't say whether or not the circadian rhythm disruption is important or if clock is doing something in these other brain regions that's completely independent maybe of its role in the SCN and circadian rhythms. So, but it's definitely something we're very interested in trying to, to tease apart. Mm <laughs> what are we going to do about them? Well, um, I think there's I think there's two reasons. First of all, when um, we know from genetic studies that mutations in the clock gene are um, associated with these disorders, so um, it could be that if you were to target clock therapeutically directly um, or one of its targets, that this might be an effective uh, treatment. Um, we also know that circadian rhythm disruption, so environmental disruptions, seem to have a huge impact on the outcome of bipolar patients. So I think it's sort of looking at it both ways, sort of the, how the mutations in these genes might lead to a vulnerability for these kinds of diseases, but then also how um, circadian rhythm disruption in general might impact a disease that somebody already has and make it worse. So I, I think there's kind of both. And like I was saying, we don't know for sure. It could be that if you have a mutation in the clock gene, you're going to have both mood-related problems and circadian-related problems, but maybe the two aren't necessarily connected. Or maybe, or it could be the mutation in clock is leading to a circadian rhythm disruption, which is then leading to the disorder. And we just, we're at such an early stage that we don't really know which is, is true. Or it could be a little bit of both. So and we're sort of looking at it in both those ways, if that answers your question. Uh-huh. We haven't considered that, but that would be interesting to do. Yeah, I don't, I don't think our lab is equipped to do that kind of thing, but, uh, but that would be interesting. Yeah, we, haven't, we hadn't thought about doing anything like that. Gosh, these guys are loud, huh? <laughs> anything else? Yeah. No, yeah, we, we do really want to get into um, looking at serotonin more directly. Um, serotonin is, is actually key to setting circadian rhythms and obviously is involved in mood regulation. And so I, I gr greatly suspect that the, ser the serotonin system is, is very, very relevant to this modulation of mood. And if we were to, to activate that circuit, we probably would get changes in mood-related behaviors. So we just haven't done that yet. Um, the dors dorsal rafe is pretty hard to work on in mice, so... Um, but uh, it's something we definitely would like to do. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right, thank you.